Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Patricia Loria. I'm a senior client engagement lead for the Americas for the Global CCS Institute. And this is the latest of our series of um, CCS talks, the technology cost curve. Um, we're excited to have a great panelist um, of tech companies who are working on this and are gonna kind of share some of their insights on why CCS tech um, costs are coming down. And it will be led by David Kearns, who's part of our commercial team um, and is a leader in thinking about CCS technology. Um, our other speakers are Tony Leo. He is the um, EVP and CTO of Fuel Cell Energy. We have Will Scheimer, um, Commercial Director for Carbon Clean Solutions. He's out of the US, um, but as most of you know, that company is headquartered in the UK. And then we have Jared Thomas, Business Development Manager for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. And again, he's out of the American office. I'm out of the DC office. Um, David's out of the Melbourne office. So you have a pretty diverse international panel here today. Um, I'm going to go through a couple housekeeping rules before I switch it over to David. First, um, probably many of you are getting used to these webinars as they become part of our daily life. But if you haven't been on this one, there's certainly a variety of views you can take. We suggest that you hit the every one view um, that will allow you to see both the panelists um, and the presentations that we'll have today. Then next, um, this session is intended to be about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, the first hour will be presentations from our speakers and then we'll save 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of the session. You can certainly feel free to send us questions throughout the presentation. We won't be asking them after um, every speaker presents though, we'll be saving them to the end. If you do wanna direct your question to a sp particular speaker, you can certainly let us know that as well. Um, we may have limited time for speakers, um, but we'll hopefully try to get to as many of them as you can. Also be aware this broadcast is being recorded. We will send um, the link to everyone who registered for the event. Um, and if you have any kind of other questions during the event, certainly feel free to um, ask and reach out. And then without any kind of further delay, I will pass this over to David Kearns to share a little bit more about the Institute and what we do and start off the presentations. Thank you, Patricia. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm David Kearns. I'm Senior Consultant in CCS Technology at the Global CCS Institute. Uh, so I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar, the CCS Technology Cost Curve. Um, so I wanted to provide a little bit of an introduction for you first about the Institute and what we're about. Um, so our mission is to accelerate the deployment and commercial viability of CCS. So CCS is what we do. It's our bread and butter. It's, it's our reason for being. Um, we're an international think tank. Uh, we have uh, offices in six countries um, and we are a member owned company. So um, we have a range of members uh, from um, national and uh, provincial governments. Uh, companies, large and small, and NGOs. Um, and we have competencies across a range of disciplines as well. Uh, there's a list there of uh, our members. It's a long list. I don't expect you to uh, examine that too closely, but uh, it essentially covers the, the who's who of CCS, uh, both on the, uh, the customer side and on the technology side and everything in between. Um, to give you a bit of an idea of some of the things we do in the Institute, so um, I'm based in the commercial team. Uh, so the Institute has three teams, the commercial team, um, the advocacy team and the client engagement team. Um, in the commercial team, um, we provide a lot of services around uh, consulting uh, as well as support for our members um, and occasionally uh, supporting our uh, advocacy people, uh, including events like this. So we, we provide um, really sort of a, a lot of the information and other repository for the information uh, around CCS. Um, and so this, this slide here just gives you a bit of an idea of some of the things we do. Um, we have a repository of data within um, the Institute around um, our system called CORE, which is our database of CCS facilities and policy worldwide. Um, and from sources of data like that, plus our experience and our, our members, 
uh, we can provide uh, very useful insights um, and consulting services for our members uh, as well as for uh, fee paying customers as well. Uh, this is an example of some of the type of advisory services that we provide. Um, in, in many regards, we are like a conventional uh, consulting firm. Uh, the difference being is that we are CCS specialists. That's what we do. All of our projects are, are related to or involved directly with CCS. Um, we don't tend to get involved in, in projects that are too far afield from CCS. And so what that gives us is a very, uh, a very good depth uh, and quality of, of uh, insights that we can provide in, in the sort of projects that we do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for today, uh, today's talks are going to be about uh, the costs of CCS. And so um, really I wanted to just give a little bit of a flavour before I hand over to our speakers today. Um, so this first slide here is talking about understanding the cost elements of CCS. So CCS is really um, it's a, a value chain where there's, there's costs are expended in different ways. Um, the main components of, of it being capital cost, uh, fixed and variable operating costs and fuel cost. Um, and what we have seen over the, the range of projects that have been um, deployed over the years is that capital costs make up the majority of the costs of CCS projects. So often energy cost gets a lot of attention um, and it's important, no doubt about it, um, but capital cost is, is definitely the most important one. And you can see here some examples from some uh, post-combustion capture CCS projects um, in the coal-fired power industry, uh, Boundary Dam, Petronova and uh, Shand. Uh, so the first two projects have already been built and are running. Uh, Shand is um, gone through feasibility. Um, the first thing that you'll notice is that the costs are coming down and um, that's not to be su uh, too surprising. Um, that's an effect that you see across many different technologies as the first of kind is rolled out and deployed. Um, we then see uh, people make uh, significant learnings uh, from those projects and from um, all the lessons that are incurred can be deployed in subsequent project. And so mistakes don't have to be made over and over again. Uh, learnings and insights can be deployed and, and uh, rolled into future designs. Um, and so we get benefits in terms of construction costs, uh, reliability, design, how do you operate the plant and that sort of thing. Um, so capital cost is very, very important. It's something that um, really we, we see a, a very significant set of improvements coming through uh, for all costs, uh, but, but capital cost is, is a, definitely one of the key ones. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and what we've been observing is that the costs of CCS are falling. So um, this chart here is from our flagship report, which is the global status of CCS report that you can obtain from the Institute's website. Um, and this is a plot of the levelized costs of CO2 capture from various um, studies and projects uh, from around the world over time. And so what we've observed here is uh, you'll see towards the middle uh, of the, the chart here that there's a, a red dot for Boundary Dam. Uh, Boundary Dam's a project operating in Canada. Um, it had costs of sitting just over a hundred US dollars a ton. Um, but shortly thereafter, when the Petronova project was deployed, um, the cost came down significantly just a few years later. Um, and some of that was, was due to uh, key learnings that were picked up in Boundary Dam. Um, some of the other reasons that we're seeing improvements in, in the cost of CCS is um, we're seeing improvements in solvents for those technologies that use solvents for carbon capture. So improvements in energy use, um, as well as reduced degradation of solvents. Um, we're seeing uh, new non-solvent based capture technologies coming along, uh, which are providing certain advantages uh, in things. Um, we're also seeing improved CO2 compression strategies as well. So these costs here are for, for capture and for CO2 compression. And so that can have an influence as well. Uh, one of the key reasons that costs are falling is around economies of scale. Um, so economies of scale are essential for any industrial operation um, and CCS is no different in that regard. Uh, the more CO2 that you can capture, uh, generally speaking, the costs per tonne go down uh, fairly significantly. And so on that previous slide, you saw that Shand had a, a much lower cost than the other two projects. The Shand project is proposed to be twice as big as those. And so a significant chunk of those uh, cost reductions are down to its larger scale. Um, and another trend that we're seeing as well is modularization. So um, there are companies that are developing modular carbon capture uh, technologies. Uh, this is an idea where essentially you design the plant um, and then you can roll it out to many uh, facilities without having to re-engineer it time and time again. You have standardized parts, standardized systems, standardized drawings, 
um, and that helps to bring the cost down, particularly for smaller uh, carbon capture applications. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's, uh, we've had a little bit of an introduction there to uh, some of the background of, of costs of CCS. Um, it's now time to hand over to our speakers. Um, so our speakers today are uh, Jared Thomas uh, from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, uh, Tony Leo uh, from Fuel Cell Energy, and Will Scheimer from Carlin Clean Solutions. So uh, without further ado, I'll stop talking. And uh, please, as, as you're listening to our speakers, uh, please uh, make sure you, if you have any questions, you type them into the chat box. Um, and we will uh, do our best to get to them. Um, we do have uh, many hundreds of people um, on the webinar tonight. So if we can't get to your questions tonight, um, it, it will be because we're limited for time. Um, but please um, put your questions down and we'll do our best to get to as many of you as we can. So um, without further ado, we will hand over. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, David. So, uh, as David mentioned, I'm Jared Thomas. I'm a business development manager at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries America. And I've been involved in carbon capture now for about the past decade. Um, much of that time was spent at Southern Company developing uh, different carbon capture technologies and also running a large scale uh, test facility that uh, MHI was using at Plant Berry. So, next slide, please. Uh, and first, I'll just start out with an introduction to MHI. Uh, MHI, actually at the beginning of this year, had some uh, uh, reorganization. And so we uh, we took the three domains that we previously had and split those up into three domains and also four segments. So the four segments aren't part of the three domains. They're really separate. I um, mean, you can see that this is just to give you an idea of the many and varied industries that MHI Group serves. Um, you know, it really runs from space exploration uh, to commercial air, um, engines and drive systems, power generation systems. And then for us, for me specifically, I'm in the engineered systems division, which falls into the plant and infrastructure systems, where we've also got uh, chemical plant um, and uh, APM automated people movers. Next slide, please. And to give you an idea of the size of MHI, I know uh, you, you've seen now how many industries we serve. Uh, this just shows you where we operate uh, globally. We see uh, nearly four, $40 billion in revenue per year, uh, over 24,000 patents uh, globally. And most of our sales actually are, are outside of Japan, which, which uh, many of those being seen in, in North America. Next slide, please. Again, I mentioned that uh, I am in the engineered systems division. We are based in Houston. Um, we uh, provide a range of different services, which includes sales support, engineering, project management. And we, of course, have our CO2 capture plants that are based uh, within this group, chemical plants. And as I mentioned, transportation, you're seeing now a picture at the bottom of the automated people movers that you might be familiar with if you've uh, gone to a theme park, maybe, or uh, to an airport. Next slide, please. And I'll just talk about, uh, now I'll just talk about, I get into our CO2 capture process, which we call the KMCDR process, it stands for Kansai Mitsubishi Carbon Dioxide Recovery Process. Next slide, please. And you can advance it one more. Okay, great. So what you're seeing here is a layout, really a process flow uh, at a high level of the KMCDR process. And you, you may be familiar with an amine system in general has this similar layout, but we've, we've really uh, gone uh, uh, further and optimized this over, over really over the past 30 years. And I'll show you a timeline in a moment. But uh, in general, we have flue gas that comes in through a quencher where we can cool it and remove some contaminants if there are some in the stream, such as SO2, uh, the absorber column is where you really see the separation, uh, where you're seeing the amine remove the CO2. And we've done some work in the absorber. Uh, the, first of all, the solvent itself is, is really, it's, this process is built around it. So the KS1 solvent, it's got a high CO2 capacity. 
low degradation and low regeneration energy. Uh, the top of the absorber, we have designed a specific, and it's a proprietary design, uh, a demister section for reducing amine losses and VOC emissions. Uh, also, we've done quite a bit of work around the regenerator, which, you know, the saturated amine goes to the regenerator, you heat it, and then it goes back to the absorber as a clean amine, and, and it does the cycle over again. And so uh, we've done quite a bit of heat integration to uh, reduce and optimize the OPEX of, of the unit. Uh, but, you know, as David mentioned earlier, uh, much of this is, uh, much of the expense is on the CapEx, and so this equipment is is very large. Um, and and so we've we've actually and you'll you'll see this in a moment uh, put in some effort into reducing design margins. For instance, this has been largely based on our experience at Petronova. Um, the KMCDR process itself produces a 99.9% .9 plus uh, pure CO2 stream. We can do it says capable of 90% plus, but you know 90 95% capture from a flue gas. Uh, again, this is an amine-based technology, and it says 28 years here. It's about 30 years now at this point. Um, uh, you know, several other improvements that we've got, uh, automatic load adjustment control. We've Since we've been developing this process, we've had significant opportunities to optimize how we control it. And so it's just basically saying that you can uh, set your output to what you want it to be in terms of CO2 production. And if there's a dynamic input, the control system will adjust automatically. Next slide, please. So this is the development timeline that I mentioned. And so it goes all the way back to 1990. And uh, you can see there that that's uh, where we really started at the beginning of our R&D. Um, to start, we, we really focused on the solvent and we screened out more than 200 solvent formulations um, from those in 1991, we selected 20 that we ultimately ended up testing at KEPCO's Nanco power plant. Um, and, and then you can see really on the left here of this diagram, we have the development timeline. And then on the right, uh, you start to see some commercial experience pick up. And so in 1994, that's when we really settled on KS1 and the KMCDR process name. Uh, and at that point had over 14,000 hours of testing to date. Uh, and then at, as we were progressing through this development timeline into 2002, 2003, 2008, you can see we started to get these commercial units. But it wasn't really until, um, apart from testing at uh, you know one ton per day level, 10 ton per day level, it wasn't really until 2011 that we had the plant berry demonstration, which was 500 tons per day, uh, that we were able to demonstrate the process on coal, flue gas, uh, and it was the entire chain of CCS. And so we captured and sequestered um, as part of the CCAR phase three in, in South Alabama. Next slide, please. Yeah, you can advance to the, thank you. Oh. All right, great. So I mentioned that we had had some commercial experience uh, in line with our development. And indeed, you can see from this map here that we've had um, uh, a number of commercial plants. Some of these here are still demonstration units. For example, uh, item number 10 is shown on there. That's the plant berry demonstration that I mentioned. Uh, we also have uh, you know, quite a few exciting projects that we're working on today even. But this just, to sh this just goes to show you that uh, we've, we've got significant commercial experience. Um, and that we can meet customer requirements uh, all the way through conceptual design uh, into project delivery. Next slide, please. And now, uh, as David mentioned, uh, we were the technology provider for the Petronova project. Uh, the Petronova project, it captures CO2 from NRG's Unit 8. Uh, it's a PRB fired. Uh, that's the Washington Parish plant and transport it, transports it about 81 miles uh, to the West Ranch oil field for enhanced oil recovery. And, you know, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, won't go through these items on the right here, but you can see that this, this large tower that you see there, that's the absorber tower. Uh, the uh, flue gas quencher feeding into that, you can see that at the bottom left. 
And um, by far the absorber tower is the largest uh, uh, piece of equipment here. And, and indeed, that's where we spent some time uh, trying to focus on reducing uh, the capex associated with that, reducing the size. And it really comes down to uh, margins of the equipment. And so, uh, you know, this, this project specifically, and, and without doing these types of projects, it's very difficult to do uh, that kind of deep optimization. So this project specifically has allowed us to really look and see what our de design margins look like and uh, how we can implement those throughout the plant. So it's not just on the absorber, right? It's on the flue gas quencher, it's on the regenerator, um, everything that's associated with the plant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, you know, I've talked a bit about coal um, and, and this just goes to show you that uh, these learnings that we're gaining from Petronova, from doing you know, various feed studies, from doing the testing at Plant Berry, they don't just apply to coal, right? So they apply to natural gas, boiler exhaust, uh, gas turbine exhaust from NGCC, for example, uh, oil-fired boiler exhaust and coal-fired boiler exhaust. And you can see that there are also a number of industrial applications where the KMCDR process is applicable. And you really can start to integrate many of these same learnings that you see from Petronova into these different applications. Next slide, please. Go ahead. And I'll talk about the advanced KMCDR process. So that's what we're calling it, advanced KMCDR process. Uh, this is a result of, of the learning that we've had throughout the development timeline over the last 30 years. Uh, and, and again, you know, David mentioned CapEx is a big lever. And so capital cost optimization, what have we done? So we're looking at about a 30% reduction in the CapEx from the conventional design, uh, now going on to the advanced K KMCDR process. Uh, and you can see that the majority of that 30%, we've, we've got it split up in a pie chart there. Majority of that 30% is in the um, direct contact cooler and the absorber, the absorber being the largest vessel there, of course, it makes sense. Um, reducing design margins is about 10%, and then we're putting a lot of effort into modularization and uh, making the process more compact and the layout more compact. Um, the, the, you can see that on the bottom left there that shows you the cost for many of the specific items like pumps, heat exchangers, internals, uh, where we are with the advanced game CDR process versus the conventional process. Um, and yeah, this, that's, that's the next step. Uh, next slide, please. And so these recent learnings to be applied, um, what we've learned from operating this, this process on uh, a large scale plant, uh, as I just mentioned a bit of, where we're reevaluating the equipment and tower design based on the actual performance. And so you just don't know, uh, you just don't know what, what kind of margins you can use and, and, and be safe, risk-free, but we do, we do now. It's, it's difficult to do that without having these large scale uh, plants and the commercial experience. Um, and so it's, you know, now we're able to refine that, optimize, reduce the equipment design margins, um, modularize and optimize our plot plan to help. And, uh, and then we have a line on here, develop realistic gas impurity assumptions during design. That helps us to specifically tailor the design to, to whatever blue gas conditions that you might have. And it's important um, because they, these uh, concentrations do greatly affect the design and how we mitigate, uh, for example, SO2 in the flue gas. And as I mentioned, um, we, we listed a 90% capture rate, but we're really now up at a 95% capture rate at the same dollars per ton, per ton uh, of CO2 cost basis. Next slide, please. And that, that is it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jared. That was an excellent presentation. Um, looking forward to some questions coming through from the audience. Um, so our next presenter, is um, excuse me. Uh, our next presenter is Tony Leo. Uh, Tony is going to be talking to us about uh, fuel cell energy's carbon capture technology. So uh, over to you. 
Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about how we use, uh, it's a unique approach to carbon capture. It actually uses a type of fuel cell that has a lot of carbon chemistry that goes on that, that helps us actually concentrate CO2 from, from an external source. So if you go to the uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about fuel cell energy. Uh, we are in the business of manufacturing and then designing and operating fuel cell power plants. Uh, so we, we sell fuel cells to customers. We also do power purchase agreements where we own the fuel cells in our generation business. Uh, we service the fuel cells, we do turnkey installation. Uh, and we also uh, have a basket of advanced technologies that we're developing uh, for our next generation of products. So. Um, and that's in the lower, lower right there. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, there's the use of carbonate fuel cells for carbon capture, work we're doing with ExxonMobil and that we've been doing with DOE. Uh, um, and that's what I'll be focusing on today. We also are developing a uh, product that produces hydrogen in addition to electricity with, based on the carbonate fuel cell. And we're also doing development work on solid oxide fuel cells, another type of high temperature fuel cell. Uh, for power generation and things like electrolysis and energy storage. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what these uh, fuel cells look like before I get into the application for carbon capture because they're unique, I know, to many people. So the, on the left there, there's a, a photograph of a fellow in our Torrington manufacturing facility in Torrington, Connecticut. He's holding a single carbonate fuel cell package. It's an air electrode, a fuel electrode, and a porous membrane between them that we call the matrix, which is where the uh, carbonate electrolyte is. And there are 400 cells stacked up behind them. Uh, so a single stack like that with more or less cells goes into our sub megawatt products, which range from 250 to 400 kilowatt. And exactly that stack behind them with 400 cells, four of those goes into our four stack module, which after power conversion and parasitics nets 1.4 megawatt. So in addition to the sub megawatt, our product line includes a one module power plant that is 1.4 megawatts, a two module power plant that is 2.8 megawatts. We have a version of that 2.8 megawatt uh, that we use for co-production of hydrogen. And to power that hydrogen equipment, it takes some of the power uh, out. So we go from 2.8 to 2.3 megawatts, but we produce 1,200 kilograms a day of hydrogen. I'll talk a little bit about uh, how that happens and how it might actually help uh, carbon capture economics. And then at the bottom, we have our three module power plant where the third module runs off leftover fuel from the first two. So it has a high electrical efficiency, about 60% versus 47% for, uh, for the other power plants. And that's the biggest system we make. People do do projects with, at larger size by deploying multiples of these systems. The largest uh, power plant, carbon, uh, carbonate fuel cell power plant in the world is in the upper right there. That's 21 of those 2.8 megawatt systems in a combined heat and power application just outside of Seoul, South Korea. And the largest one in the US is in the lower right, that's in Bridgeport, Connecticut. That's five of the 2.8 megawatt systems, uh, which produce 14 megawatts. And the waste heat from the fuel cells is used in an organic ranking cycle to make an additional megawatt. So it's 15 megawatts total, and a little bit higher electrical efficiency because of that bottoming cycle that we add. So that's essentially, this, this is our commercial product line of fuel cell power plants. And what I'd like to do now is talk about how we use a unique aspect of the electrochemistry of the fuel cell uh, to do carbon capture. So if you go to the next slide, please. So there's that guy again, holding that cell. And there's a, a cartoon of, of what actually goes into the cell. The anode is the fuel electrode. It's where we send uh, methane and steam, basically. The uh, cathode is the air electrode. And the reason we send methane and steam to this hydrogen fuel cell is because it's a high temperature fuel cell. It runs at around 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that's a temperature, uh, and we have nickel catalysts inside. And that's a temperature where with those catalysts, you can do what we call internal reforming you actually have a steam methane reforming reaction that produces hydrogen inside the stack from methane. 
And what that does for us is it's a very efficient way to make hydrogen because it needs heat and it needs water and the fuel cell produces both of, of those things. And in taking heat, fuel cell waste heat to drive the reforming reaction, we increase the efficiency. And we also help cool down and thermally manage the fuel cell stack. So it's a, it's a nice uh, uh, feature that has some additional side benefits. So after the internal forming reaction, we basically have converted the methane to hydrogen. That CO2 that you see on the first line there that came basically from the methane molecule, that's gonna be exhausted. But as we make electricity, as we convert those four hydrogens to electricity, you'll see that there's actually four extra CO2s that are produced in the fuel electrode. And that's a result of the fact that our carbonate fuel cell, like all fuel cells and like all batteries, all electrochemical systems work the same way. There's an electrode that makes electrons. There's another electrode that consumes them. You hook a wire between them and you get electricity. But to complete the circuit, there is, you may remember a salt bridge. Uh, there's an electrolyte that transports some kind of ion uh, from one electrode to the other. In our case, it's a carbonate ion. And what that means is that when that fuel reaction happens, you create those four CO2s. You need to recycle them back to the air electrode because you'll notice that the cathode reaction consumes air and those four CO2s. So what's going to come out of the fuel electrode is the five CO2s. Four of them have to be delivered back to the air electrode. And the fifth is what's gonna be exhausted uh, as the CO2 exhaust. And when people started to look at ways to capture carbon from dilute blue gas streams, we realized that this is a potential way that we could use this weird aspect of our technology by interrupting that recycle. If those five CO2s come out of there and we grab them, uh, and, and, it's, and it's pretty easy to do that because that's a fairly concentrated CO2 stream, the air electrode won't get the CO2s it needs, but we can deliver those CO2s from the external flue gas source. So the idea is that we can send CO2 into the air electrode and it is essentially electrochemically pumped from that very CO2 dilute stream to a more uh, smaller stream that is very CO2 concentrated. Another benefit of this that we found as we first started to do cell tests and stack tests, and it took us a while to figure out the mechanism, is that if there's NOx in that blue gas stream, uh, about 70% of that NOx will be destroyed as, it, as, as that stream passes through the, the air electrode channels. Uh, and that, that's a mixture of electrochemical and catalytic processes that do that, but that's a nice benefit of, of the system. Another benefit of the system is that it actually is a net water producer. So in, in certain areas that can be a benefit uh, depending on the type of plant and, and uh, the water situation in, in the area. And, and this fact that we efficiently can convert methane to hydrogen, that's the basis for our hydrogen export product that I mentioned, but it's something that you can do while you're doing carbon capture as well. So it can be an additional revenue stream that can help the economics of carbon capture. So it's, it's converting basically this this fuel cell stack into an electrochemical reactor that's doing all sorts of other beneficial things. Uh, so the next slide, please. So this basically is the idea. So if you, you take a fossil emission and we think this is broadly applicable to coal power plants, natural gas power plants, industrial boilers, uh, steam generators, um, we've, the, most of our development work until recently uh, was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy with a focus on capture from coal-based systems. Uh, coal-based systems, the advantage there is that the CO2 concentration is relatively high. Um, we are, uh, as I'll discuss a little bit more, we're working with ExxonMobil now on capture from natural gas sources, lower CO2 concentrations. So we're working to optimize uh, uh, the, the capture uh, for those conditions. But in all cases, the basic idea is that you deliver that flue gas to our air intake of the fuel cell. And as it flows through the air electrode channels, the CO2 is electrochemically pumped from the air electrodes to the fuel electrodes. That fuel stream is much less voluminous than the uh, oxygen stream. 
So and you, you take the concentration of CO2 from four to 15% up to about 70%. And, uh, and now the CO2 is in a stream with a very different molecule. Most of what the rest of the gases in that stream are hydrogen. It's very easy to separate CO2 from that stream. You just compress it and cool it. And it's easy to take the CO2 off from that stream. Um, now we are not uh, running the fuel cell on CO2. That would be great. But as far as we can tell, there's no thermodynamically feasible way to do that. The fuel cell is running on natural gas. So there is a natural gas fuel input to the fuel cell. Uh, and we cannot do carbon capture unless we make electricity. It's a side uh, reaction of electricity production. And so uh, there is this fact that while you're do it, doing the carbon capture, you're also producing uh, electricity. And that is a significant benefit for the economics. And I'll give you an example of that on the next slide, if we go. So this is a, a large scale system that was designed under our uh, DOE uh, supported work, uh, targeting 550 megawatt coal plant. Uh, we, we determined that uh, you need 319 megawatts of these carbonate fuel cell systems to, uh, uh, to, to capture 90% of the CO2 from that plant and we I worked with AECOM to do a fairly detailed estimate of what that cost, uh, capital cost and operating cost, uh, using kind of the rules of the uh, analysis that were specified by DOE and NETL. Uh, and we generally express that in terms of overall cost of capture or cost of electricity. But what we're doing in this chart on the, on the right there is, is we're breaking down the various components of costs uh, and expressing them as the cost of capturing CO2 in dollars per ton. Uh, and so you see the, the raw cost there, uh, obviously capital cost, uh, there's natural gas uh, fuel cost, which you, you don't usually see in, in, in a uh, carbon capture system. Uh, but what, and so it all, it all adds up to maybe $70 a ton in that neighborhood. <clears throat> but you have the power generation revenue, which is uh, offsetting it by almost $40 a ton. So you have a net uh, cost of capture, which is where you saw our little dot on that uh, cost curve at the beginning of the uh, webinar. And that cost of capture in the mid 30s, uh, uh, because you're able to offset the capital and operating costs of the carbonate fuel cell system uh, with the power generation that you're doing while you're capturing CO2. So that is the main uh, uh, advantage, we think, of this technology is that that power generation revenue uh, can can significantly offset the cost of capture. Uh, it's obviously dependent on what the local value of electricity is, uh, but uh, with the right set of economics, it, it can be uh, definitely an attractive proposition. The other thing I'll mention here is that while we're capturing carbon, while we're taking our fuel exhaust and extracting the CO2, there's no reason why we can't also extract hydrogen at that point. Uh, and so you can co-produce hydrogen while you're doing cap carbon capture. And uh, the economics for that varies widely depending on the value of hydrogen, but it's, it's, it's not, you can calculate there are significant additional uh, revenue offsets associated with that hydrogen production if you find the right customer that can drive the CO, cost of CO2 capture uh, you know, way below $30 a ton if you have the right constellation of uh, hydrogen customers and, and power offtake. So that is the, the key advantage of the technology, co-production of power for sure, possibly hydrogen, reducing the cost of carbon capture. Next slide, please. And I believe this is my last slide. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we've been working for uh, quite a long time on this technology, going from small cells to the large full-size stack tests. Uh, initially with a uh, focus on capture from coal sources. But as we were doing that work, uh, we started to collaborate with ExxonMobil on capturing from natural gas sources. Uh, and we just expanded uh, what we call this joint development agreement uh, to, to, to essentially take our carbonate fuel cell stack and stack module, which is really good at making electricity and kind of good at capturing carbon and make it really good at capturing carbon. Uh, and so this two year effort is the first two years of uh, an effort that we think will, we hope will, will lead to a demonstration of the technology at uh, Exxon Mobil facility somewhere. Uh, and um, uh, the results that we're getting are bearing out the, the, uh, 
promise for the technology. So it, it's it's early stage, but we think it has the potential to be uh, to play a significant role in, in uh, carbon capture as we march toward decarbonization. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, look forward to some questions from the audience um, after that. Um, our final speaker today is Will Scheimer from Carbon Clean Solutions. And I'd just like to let the audience know that um, if you've got questions, if they've been coming up, please start sending those through now. You don't have to wait to the end to put your questions in. Uh, it just makes it a little easier for us to, to sort of compile those into a sensible list for us to work through at the end. So. Um, so yeah, please, please get those questions coming now. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Will. Great, thank you, David. I hope my audio is coming in clear to everyone. Yeah, thanks for everyone's one time today. We're gonna talk uh, Carbon Clean Solutions about uh, modular carbon capture and talk a bit about the industrial market and the fit of this technology for uh, decarb decarbonizing industrial sites. Uh, next slide, please. Right. So the company, um, Carbon Clean Solutions, company has been around uh, going 10 years now. We started out as a solvent development company, and we've uh, recently moved into systems development. We are now working with uh, new investors, including uh, Chevron, Marabini, and other financial investors. And we've developed, you know, a portfolio of global partners that are on the right, including uh, the companies listed, uh, to develop and execute. Uh, carbon capture and utilization projects at both the technology and with partners and EPC level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the experience map here, th this is actually very different than the first uh, presentation. I want to point this out. So Carbon Clean Solutions, uh, we have experience in different uh, applications, I think, and it's worth talking about in this talk here. For instance, uh, we're very active in renewable uh, natural gas upgrading in Europe. And in these systems, these tend to be smaller scale uh, CO2 removal opportunities where we're looking at um, some sort of bio feed and actually removing the CO2 from that uh, renewable methane to meet a pipeline specification. And what's interesting about these systems is they're, they're small in the carbon capture world, but there was a lot of learnings that were developed around the ability to modularize uh, the carbon capture portion of this scope. Um, and so some of that learning we are, are trying to take to the industrial carbon capture sector. Um, the other areas we show on this map is, is a number of demonstration projects that have been done in CO2 capture. And so these include all the leading world institutes like National Carbon Capture Center, uh, TCM, uh, and other facilities. Um, and then additionally, the third sector we show here is the CO2 industrial reuse which uh, is, is abbreviated ICCU. And so the company uh, was involved in uh, deploying a 174 ton per day uh, ICC unit in Southern India that's been operating since uh, 2016. Uh, it's about 60,000 tons per year. So it would still be what you'd call a mid-scale facility. Um, but the reason I show this map here is to give some context in terms of the company's focus, not just on, uh, let's say, large scale CO2 capture uh, power plants, but also we think there's a developing market uh, for industrial capture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first off, in terms of the technology, because this presentation is really about technology and cost curve, I wanted to share some information uh, from a recent study that was conducted with a partner, Wood Group, and this was around a 4,000 ton per day uh, carbon capture facility on a U.S. Gulf Coast basis. So uh, this would be more in line in, in a large scale power application. But I did want to share in terms of the capital operating cost estimates. And so uh, these have been estimated uh, before compression. So I do want to note that. So this would be the uh, gas pre-treating and then the carbon capture scope of the, uh, the project. So before compression. Uh, but we do want to point out with uh, our technologies, which are solvent based, so they are our solvent based separation, the conventional technologies, which I think the first presenter did a really good job covering, um, do have, you know, significant capital costs because they're large scale. And there can be a range of that dependent on the site conditions and the uh, 
you know, the EPC uh, level estimate that's required. <clears throat> In terms of the operating cost, you know, for the solvent system, there's also variability on that. And that's shown in the lower right for this case. And the utilities typically that are available would be uh, a low pressure steam, um, a cooling water, uh, electricity, some instrument air, and then the solvent itself. And so with this assessment, uh, we came out to more a 50-50 split uh, in terms of the uh, capital versus operating. Again, this was before compression. Uh, and taken assumptions in one of the IEA reports that's been released. Um, but on the other side of this, I also want to talk about in terms of uh, looking at different sources of CO2. And so the company, we've, we've gone through a number of demonstration tests, as I mentioned, and have actually uh, been involved in projects that are looking at um, capturing CO2 from natural gas combustion, at TCM, but then all the way up to biogas feeds, which can be up to 50, 50 percent uh, CO2 in the feed gas. So we've had experience in terms of a lot of different gas conditions and CO2 concentrations that we think is very relevant to the industrial carbon capture space. Uh, next slide, please. And here's what I, what I really wanted to focus on today is the Gen 2 technology that Carbon Clean Solutions is developing. And this is what we call an intensified uh, modular carbon capture uh, plant. Um, the picture that we're showing here is from a one ton per day pilot that is currently ongoing in the United Kingdom. And this gives you a sense of the scale and uh, comparison. So this is a one ton per day unit. So it is a pilot scale, so a unit you would put you know, at a facility for testing, so beyond bench scale. Um, and what we show here in the picture is actually a comparison of one of the pieces of the key process equipment, which is the absorber. Um, and on the left here, you'll see the CCSL, the Gen 2 uh, technology, and that is a rotating pack bed absorber. And what you can see is within that module, the comparison of that versus a conventional absorber. And the hypothesis with further testing here is that this, um, notably the absorber and also other areas of the carbon capture process uh, can be intensified. And with the result of that, you could have a um, significant shrinkage in the size of the process equipment. Because one of the challenges with uh, the solvent-based separations is really the, really the size of the equipment <clears throat> and the overall footprint of the equipment. So uh, with this system, we, we are actually in the process of testing one in the UK, as I mentioned, and also one in the US with a partner gas technology institute at the National Carbon Capture Center. Um, from these two tests, we expect to take this technology very quickly to a higher TRL, a techn technical readiness level. And our objective is to get to a TRL five or six by fall of this year with test data here uh, shortcoming very, very soon. Um, and then in terms of the value proposition, so for industrial companies that are interested in decarbonizing, what we think the technologies fit here is that you have a, a very compact system. So you have something that you could put on a number of modules. Uh, you could shop fabricate uh, the majority of the process equipment and then ship that equipment to the site. Uh, on the back of a truck. So you wouldn't need to, uh, you know, actually have the absorber shipped in multiple pieces or constructed on site, which is more, more typical for large scale projects. And so by having uh, an intensified unit, uh, that would allow uh, not only the uh, installation time to be reduced, but more importantly, um, the capital costs. Because I think we've all seen from the numbers, really the, the barrier in this industry today is capital cost on the carbon capture and compression. Um, so the, the goal here is actually to shrink the absorber to uh, roughly 10 to 15% the size of a conventional absorber. So we're talking very dramatic reduction in the height of the absorber. And again, the ability to put that piece of equipment onto a module, which is just not done today in industry. Uh, the, additionally, the innovations we're looking at are also intensifying the solvent. So Carbon Clean Solutions has experience with developing solvents. We have our, our CDR Max uh, solvent that we've used in both demo and commercial plants. And the um, objective here is actually to dewater that solvent uh, to get to a higher viscosity solvent that could be used 
uh, in the absorption and stripping phase. And by having a higher viscosity solvent with less water, the objective is to uh, significantly reduce the steam or heat duty. Um, we will have some additional electrical requirements that will be required for the uh, rotating pack bed uh, intensified absorber, but we feel like there's a very strong case in terms of overall uh, operating cost reduction as a secondary benefit. But I do want to be clear, the objective of, the, of this technology is CapEx reduction and uh, really reduction in plot space. Um, so I think we, we mentioned this. Um, and finally, I just want to touch again on the, the theme of modularization. Um, and other, other speakers have, have spoken to this also. And I think a lot of people are, are familiar with modularization. But I would like to say, you know, the ability to look at, at this as a almost more of a compressor type market where you would shop fabricate the, uh, the process equipment and you Apologize for that. Um, you could actually uh, ship the process equipment in a, in a unit up approach where you would actually take parallel trains of these absorbers and put them you know, in parallel uh, at a industrial site so that you would have very fast uh, installation time and an ability to take a, a relatively standard design and replicate that versus having to custom design each unit. Um, so the company's goal, we have a very aggressive goal, I will say, is to get to a carbon capture you know, before compression cost of $30 a ton, and we want to go very quickly. And so with this technology, uh, we're looking to scale uh, at least to 10 tons per day uh, by next year and then get this into the uh, industrial sector, which we think is, is 100 to 500 tons per day by 2022-2023. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then in summary, I, I would say um, we, we are looking for partners. And so, um, you know, the company, we have focused historically on solvent development. Now we've really gone into full-scale system development. We've listened to clients. Clients have told us uh, they, want, um, they want carbon capture systems that they can do either demonstration testing today at industrial sites or in the future, obviously, commercial uh, capture and util utilization. So uh, we're looking to form more partnerships with end users, uh, EPCs, to get these solutions to market. Um, we also think, you know, with the, uh, the events in the world, that there's going to be a lot of more focus in terms of green technologies and ability uh, to get projects moving faster. And so we think uh, with government response here, this could also open up uh, some opportunities in terms of industrial carbon capture and utilization. Uh, and finally, uh, really a focus on industrial sites. And I, I think that that's a little bit different from a market focus. Um, we think there is a fit in that range of about 100 to 500 tons per day of capturing and then either um, sequestering EOR or eventually reusing that CO2 in applications. Um, and so uh, looking uh, to connect with end users in the industrial sector, and these could be cement, plants, steel, um, refineries, you know, waste to energy. Uh, but we think this technology could have a very good fit for industrial uh, uh, carbon emissions and helping to decarbonize these sites. Um, so thank you. I just, uh, last slide, I just included my contact information in here in case anyone would like to contact me uh, after this webinar. So uh, David and the whole CCS team, thank you for the time today. Thank you, Will. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, we're now transitioning into the questions and answers part of uh, the webinar. Uh, we've already received a very long list of questions and I apologize in advance, we will not have time to get through all of them. There are just far too many. Um, so I've been scan scanning these and, and we'll, we'll try and get across, I guess, the, the gist of the questions as best I can. Um, some of the early questions were regarding the slides that I presented, so I'll quickly run through a few of those. Um, one of the first components was um, understanding the assumptions behind um, the, the cost numbers uh, that we had seen in our, our main um, capture cost uh, slide. Um, so we've tried to make those as, as level as possible, and so um, but doing that, we've, we've tried to be uh, as consistent as possible with the information that's available. So uh, they're for capture only. They are for including CO2 compression after the capture plant uh, for a plant life of 30 years, discount rate of 8% um, and a capacity factor of 85%. Now, some plants may or may not fit that precisely, but it gives us an apples, 
with Apple's comparison as best we can. Um, the second question was uh, asking a question about um, boundary, the boundary dam capture cost, asking whether it included the approximately 500 million Canadian dollars spent on plant upgrades separate from the CCS plant. No, it doesn't include those. So um, the uh, International CCS Knowledge Centre, who are the ones who provide information about that facility, um, they have specifically carved that out and we agreed with them because those those investments really are separate. The CCS uh, investment is the part that we're interested in. So, so no, it doesn't include that. Um, moving on to, just bear with me. There was a question here for, where are we? Um, I guess a, a general question that we had for everybody, and maybe this is this sort of fits with one of the questions I'd prepared earlier as well, is maybe you'd like to ask each of our speakers um, what your views are on what do you think are the factors that are going to make CCS more competitive uh, going forward over, say, the next five, ten years? What do you think are going to be the main drivers of that? Uh, Jared, would you like to answer that one? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think we've hit on it multiple times already. It's uh, just it's it's just doing it more. It's it's uh, becoming an expert in and doing these things faster, um, modularizing, producing them uh, at a higher rate. And so you see some economies of scale, not just in the terms of of uh, the CO2 capacity, but the more units that you produce, you're going to see some economies of scale there. Um, as well, and and I don't think that that should be understated. I think that uh, as as time moves forward, and as we produce more of these units, uh, not just larger, uh, you're going to see costs come down uh, significantly as we as and you know we're going to get more experience. And so you know the design margins that I mentioned, where we're seeing 30% cost reduction on capex, uh, potentially you could see some further optimization there as well. Right, thanks. Uh, Tony? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And in our case specifically, we're at a somewhat earlier stage uh, than some of the absorption solutions. So for us specifically, it's getting, you know, engineered systems out there uh, in the field operating. Get this thing out of the lab, basically, is a key thing for us. Uh, and the other thing I would say that's important is finding ways to monetize the CO2, uh, the 45Q tax credits, those kind of things. Uh, you know, we're all working on reducing the cost of capture and we're all focused on, you know, getting below 40 in the 30s or even lower. And, but it's not going to zero. <laughs> so there has to be some way uh, to monetize uh, that, um, whether it's carbon taxes or whatever. I think that's key going forward. Excellent. And uh, Will, did you have any comments on um, drivers for costs coming down? Yeah, my only other comment was I think incremental innovation. I actually think um, the technologies on the capture side, there are, are good technologies out there, well proven, and the ability not just you know through projects as Jared mentioned, but also through incremental innovation. Let's say and how we execute these projects um, and how we actually change the uh, the business model to some extent to to make the projects more scalable, standardized. A replicate like other industries like natural gas processing have done where you can see very significant cost reduction you know even with the same technology if, if you take that technology and you make a fifth of a kind of that you can see cost reduction up to 30 to 40 percent uh, just from uh, amortizing that engineering over multiple projects so uh, i think that would be my only addition excellent thanks will uh next question was for uh jared um it's it's actually a reasonable question. So um, you mentioned that you can get extremely high purities of CO2 uh, from your process, but uh, if we were able to tolerate a lower quality of CO2, do you think that would reduce the cost significantly? Um, you know, it's it's certainly possible. Uh, this you know 99.9% um, plus purity of CO2. It's, uh, it's, in, it's sort of inherently baked in to how we run this unit. And so, uh, you know, there aren't, um, apart from, you know, in the compression and dehydration, there aren't really extra steps that we take. It's just how you run the unit. Uh, so it's, it's not really, um, it's not clear, but it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And um, another question for you, Jared. Um, the uh, question is around um, whether your process is able to tolerate higher CO2 streams from, from different industries, say going up to 25, 30, 35%. 30, 40, yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, it certainly does tolerate those higher CO2 streams. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so, um, oh yes, there was a, a question here about uh, capture fraction, and this is maybe a question for for, um, for more of you as well. Is that 90% capture fraction seems to have settled over the years as as a sort of a de facto standard for a lot of these capture processes? Um, but we're now seeing movement towards higher capture fractions, 95% or even higher. Um, what are your thoughts on that in terms of you know it's it's uh, the ability to do it uh, and to do it cost effectively? Uh, Jared? Sure, yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, we, we've moved from really 90 to 95 percent already on the same dollars per ton cost basis. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of doing it cost effectively, well, it's uh, it's really, it's not impacting in terms of dollars per ton um, uh, any extra that we have to spend uh, for CapEx, for example, on the project. And so we're able to get there um, already uh, seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, have you found after a few years at uh, Petronova, um, now that you've had a few years of sort of experience of, of the plant running, any comments around the the uh, maintenance costs or, or the operating costs? Has anything surprised you? Have you have you sort of seen anything interesting that you you didn't expect? Uh, you know, uh, if for those kinds of specific questions, I would probably direct them to uh, Petronova. Uh, you know, and, and if you have contacts there, uh, because as as you know, they're the ones that are operating the unit. Um, as as far as I know, they uh, they've been doing well. So um, you know, any further comments on that and detail on on what they're doing in terms of the maintenance cost uh, would have to really be directed to them. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here really I think could, could apply to all the speakers so I'll ask for each of your input on this. Um, what are your thoughts around uh, carbon capture and utilisation other than EOR, some other applications, what are your thoughts on that in terms of whether it's going to play any role in, in helping increase CCS development and reducing costs? Jared? Uh, sure, so utilisation, uh, I think that there, there could be uh, a, um, a role for utilisation in terms of decreasing the cost of CCS, CCUS overall. Um, I think the, the issue that you currently run into, of course, and, and everyone knows this, is that um, you're producing so much CO2 that you don't really have markets currently in place for some of these products that you can produce uh, through uh, CO2 utilization. And so, you know, if you're talking about um, enhanced methanol production, fertilizer production, well, the markets are only so large for those. And then if you're talking about even taking CO2 and polymerizing it um, in, you know, with some catalyst in a pressure vessel or something like that, well, then still your markets are only so large. And so mm. currently, um, you know, the, 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 what you look at currently are, are enhanced oil recovery and of course sequestration. And and so those those kinds of volumes of CO2 that you're producing are just so so big uh, that it, quite a bit of work would have to be done on developing markets uh, for those products that you're creating with utilization. Um, but it's not out of the question. I think that there's um, exciting work going on. And in fact, I've seen quite a few things come across that uh, could, could turn out to uh, really help with it. Okay, great. Uh, Tony, did you have anything to add? Uh, I agree with all that. And um, uh, I guess the way I think about utilization as it's perhaps a way to sort of kickstart carbon capture in the early phase. Uh, as carbon capture gets successful, if you start to think about carbon capture being widely deployed on the fossil generation fleet, uh, Jared's right. You're producing so much CO2 that you're, you're way beyond what the uh, typical uh, CO2 industrial market consumes, and even beyond the DOR. Um, and so then you have to look at, ultimately, you have to look at sequestration. But to kind of kickstart the, the acceptance of the technology, I think that's where utilization will play a role. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, will, did you have anything to add? 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think <clears throat> utilization can really help uh, get some business cases together, uh, it, it, let's say more near term. And so, although the technology I think are uh, more immature, let's say, than the carbon capture side. I mean, there is a lot of development like in the cement applications. Um, we see some applications in greenhouses, al although it's small. I think the point that the amount of CO2 that's consumed, it, it just, you can't consume a full power plant emission today. Um, but I do think with the X Prize and a lot of the R&D work going on in terms of electrochemical um, conversions that there will be business cases that can be developed around the utilization. And I, I feel like that could be a way to get um, projects moving more in the short term of a, of a manageable CapEx budget uh, mm -hmm. and really get some more maturity in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Um, thanks, Will. Um, next question is for Tony. Um, there's been a question about the tolerance of, of the uh, fuel cell systems for, uh, for SOX and for sulfur compounds. Um, how do you manage those in, in your fuel cells? Yeah, we have to clean them out. Uh, the, the tolerance on the fuel side is, is um, uh, very, very low. Uh, on the air side, the tolerance is somewhat higher. The main thing that uh, sulfur does uh, to our fuel cell is it it poisons that reforming catalyst that I mentioned, the thing that converts to methane. So we have to strip the sulfur out um, uh, really, really cleanly on the fuel side and, and significantly cleanly on the air side as well. Mm. So any carbon capture system that we use will do uh, some significant uh, cleanup on the, uh, on the fuel bags. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Um, another question for you. Um, can your fuel cells work on biogas, so mixture of methane and CO2? Oh, absolutely. And the thing about the carbonate fuel cells is that they're particularly tolerant of that CO2 dilution. And I, I think something like half of our units in California are running on on-site biogas. We have to strip, mm -hmm. what we have to do is we have to clean out the moisture, obviously. We have to take the sulfur out and, and siloxanes come out with them as well. Uh, but we don't have to take the CO2 out. Uh, and, and that's a significant benefit because that's a, co a costly and energy process. Uh, so um, yeah, we, we love biogas. Excellent. Uh, another fuel cell question. Um, given the advantages of low net capture cost, why hasn't this been yet scaled up for large scale CO2 capture? We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> is make it, you know, as I said, we've got a, a, a stack platform that is really good at making power and kind of good at carbon capture. And what we mm -hmm. want to do is get really good at carbon capture. So we're working on that. And then the next step is to, is to scale it up uh, for large scale carbon capture. Okay, great. Um, in your slides, Tony, you mentioned that um, the economics are uh, quite dependent on the prices of natural gas and electricity. What sort of combinations would be the sweet spot for, for your technology? Well, what you probably won't see, but we, what we'd like is if you think about a low natural gas cost, $4 per MMBTU, which is not, that's that's sort of not out of the question, obviously, these days. I, I think in the economics I showed in the analysis that we did uh, back in, I think, 2018, there was a higher natural gas assumed and there was a six cent power cost. But um, what you're likely to see is, is uh, what we would love is a low fuel cost, say $4, three and a half per MBTU, and a good retail power value, 12 cents, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. You're not gonna get that for these large scale systems. Um, mm -hmm. um, to the extent that you direct markets or stuff like that, that, that can benefit. It. Okay, so thank you. Really high power cost and really low fuel cost. Yes. <laughs> um, question for uh, Jared. Um, what is the tolerance of your technology for variable operation of the upstream power station? Um, so, you know, I, I can't really give you a, a number in terms of tolerance because uh, are you talking about, you know, um, swing in of the CO2 concentration. I, I expect or, that's what the question means, yeah. Or, you know, swing in the flow rate of, of, of uh, flue gas flow to the unit. I mean, there are, you know, it's an inherently dynamic system. And so mm -hmm. there are several different uh, points or um, areas that you could really focus on in, in answering the question. But uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, 
we've done quite a bit of work on developing the control system specifically for that. And so uh, what we call the automatic load adjustment control system, it really does allow you to uh, set, uh, you know, fix a set point, for example, in the CO2 outlet um, or capture rate. And uh, it will take the uh, feed as dynamic as it might be and, and adhere to that fixed set point. And so it, it performs really well in that regard, uh, specifically because of the work that's been ongoing on the uh, control system. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that, that question of flexibility is probably relevant to, to uh, Tony and, and Will as well. So um, do, you, do you get any sense that, that your technology is able to, to adapt? You know, obviously power markets these days require sort of flexible delivery of power. Um, how, how tolerant are your systems to, to changing needs of, of customers for, for power? I mean, I, I, I've just uh, go and I mean, it, our technology is essentially a baseload technology. We like to plug it into certain power output and keep it there. Um, mm -hmm. That's the best economically, uh, that's the, and the stacks kind of like that. Um, but what mm -hmm. we're working on is work on being very flexible in terms of the availability of that fluid, fluid gas. In other words, we can run in carbon capture mode where we're taking in that fluid gas. Uh, and capturing CO2, or if for some reason the host plant stops operating and we want to keep operating, we can just run in power gen only mode. And so we're spending a fair amount of time figuring out what that transition looks like and how to manage that transition. So we want to be flexible in terms of dealing with the flue gas, but we would like to park ourselves in a relatively constant power output. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, a question for Will. Um, are your solvents available on a commercial or licensed basis? Yeah, no, the, the solvents are available on a commercial basis. So we've, um, you know, we actively ship solvents in, in Europe to the biogas plants I mentioned. Uh, we have a commercial reference in India where, where we're shipping commercial solvents. So, um, and then in the US, we've done uh, demonstration testing with the solvent. So um, I, I think though we are flexible companies. So with the right partner, if there was more of a desire uh, to license the solvent, that would be something we would definitely consider. Uh, but to date, as a means to generate cash, we have been uh, selling the, the solvents commercially. We're going to, as I mentioned, with the new technology, the new technology has been designed around a higher performance version of the solvent. So we've really taken the solvent as a learning to design uh, these new intensified systems. But I would say we, we are fairly flexible uh, in terms of our, our commercial uh, partnerships there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the uh, question here for Will, can you expand more on what you mean by this is about CapEx reduction? Um, what is it about CapEx reduction that is, has been your focus? Yeah, so we, we've focused uh, mainly on, you know, it's a solvent-based system. So when we looked at the CapEx of the capture, if you want to call it the capture island uh, before it goes to the compressor, we looked at the absorber and the absorber, um, our, our assessment and with our commercial reference, we estimate the absorber could be up to 40, 40% of the cost of the carbon capture island. And so the picture I showed was actually um, a way to shrink the size of that absorber significantly. Um, and the goal would be that you, you have a unit that you could modularize, as I said, and then you, you, you unit up or you build multiple of those units. And although maybe your first unit is not actually cheaper. Uh, you know, it takes a kind of economies of scale in terms of nth of a kind. But when you get to unit four or five um, with a, a pre-engineered design, you've amortized that engineering cost and you've picked up efficiencies and chop fabrication. So I think we think the absorber number one, we are working with partners also in the stripping process um, because the stripper is also another major piece of equipment and uses most of the energy in the process. So there is work going on there as a later stage, but we do think um, the absorber is the focus right now. And, um, and that's what we're trying to, to really sh shrink to where it could be put in these modules on the back of a truck bed. Great, thanks, Will. Uh, question really, uh, I think, can uh, go to all three of our speakers. Um, could you make a comment about the um, sort of maintenance and reliability of your of your technology? Um, uh, how reliable are they, um, and what sort of measures do you need to take to keep them operating reliably over time? Uh, Jared. 
Yes, for ours, it's, you know, the maintenance period generally follows uh, the uh, host unit. And so, you know, the host unit maintenance cycle, it's great because uh, you, you don't really have anything extra. If you're doing, uh, say, a maintenance outage once every 18 months or something like that, uh, the maintenance for the carbon capture unit can really follow that. Um, in terms of the reliability, um, I admit, I, my experience has been that the reliability of the carbon capture unit is uh, very high. And, and so from testing at Plant Berry, when I managed that unit, we were at um, a 90, something like a 98%, above a 98, maybe 98.6% um, availability. And so it was, you know, that even being a, uh, a research and demonstration test. And so you can imagine for uh, the commercial units, we're targeting something that's also very high. Um, uh, Tony, how about you? Yeah, I'm just going off of our power generation experience. Uh, um, we have very high availability um, in the high 90s. Our planned maintenance is uh, really minimal. Every seven years, we have to replace the cells in the stack modules. So what we do, what we do is we do a stack module swap. We take the old module back to the factory and put new cells in it and recycle the old cells, melt them down basically. That's the main. Um, there are you know other minor maintenance events uh, that are all done while the plant is operating. So we try to, to make sure that, that um, minimize the amount of shutdown that have to be for raw maintenance. Um, you know, we used to uh, uh, be, be kind of uh, have, have to trip off the grid in the event of grid disturbances. Uh, that's all been kind of resolved with, with some new regulations about low voltage drive, drive through and stuff like that. So generally speaking, on the power generation experience, it's very high availability. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll, we fully expect to basically just track with the host plant as far as the overall availability, availability and maintenance cycles. Mm. Uh, Will, how about you? Yeah, I think with um, the commercial reference I mentioned in India, the availability has been, been very good. It is a solvent that's a, a conventional static solvent system. But what we've learned is that the, the pre-treating of the gas is actually very important. And so you can have fluctuations in the pre-treatment that can go downstream into the capture unit. So designing the pre-treatment up front for in the right NOx, SOx removal is pretty important. Um, for the newer technology that we show, the Gen 2, uh, we are proposing an additional piece of rotating equipment, right? So that's going to have a maintenance schedule uh, similar to a compressor. Uh, so we are going to be getting a lot more data out of these pilots uh, this summer and the fall. Uh, but, but I would say with more rotating equipment, you do need to have, you know, a more robust maintenance schedule on that equipment. Mm -hmm. And within the systems that are, are operating at commercial scale today, traditionally you, your pumps would tend to, from my experience, be your, your highest maintenance item. And so, um, you know, the pumps, uh, this rotating absorber, the blowers, um, you will have to have a maintenance schedule around those, but we are, we're confident, you know, with um, the test data we'll get and the, the scaling of this, that all this can be addressed with a good maintenance schedule and still maintaining, you know, 90% plus reliability for, for commercial operations. Thank you, Will. Uh, another question for you. Um, question about the modularization and, and shrinking of carbon capture units. Um, besides just obviously working on cost and trying to bring cost down, do you see smaller footprints and smaller physical size of units opening up new opportunities for your capture plants that maybe weren't open to them before? Yeah, and when I mentioned in talking with clients, um, obviously cost is a major issue that comes up, but actually in some cases plot space was an equally uh, important challenge to overcome. And so I think when we look at industrial sites in particular, you know, brownfield facilities, when you're looking at a refinery or something where the plot space can be very limited, dependent on location, right? A lot of times there just isn't room for a whole nother process unit. So um, part of our goal with, with this, I would say, you know, equally as important as cost is reduction in footprint in the height, 
the ability to stack modules if needed so that we can get these modules into industrial sites with limited space. And maybe you do it first on a demonstration basis, but the demonstration basis then opens up uh, later commercial scale operations where you could actually stack the modules versus having to, to just stick build you know, a new large piece of equipment. Mm. Thank you, Will. Um, question that can probably go to all three of you again. Um, what uh, what do you believe the sort of uh, reasonable economic upper limit of the capture fraction would be? So we mentioned going from 90, say, to 95%. You know, how high can we push that number before we start getting into very expensive operation? Uh, Jared? Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's uh, probably case specific. Um, you know, I would ask why would you need more than 95%, first of all, but of course, Right, the more that you go over 95%, um, the more uh, contact you have to have in your absorber. And so what that means is that for an amine process, your absorber grows. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you could you could go very, very high and get, you know, really close to 100%, but why, why would you need it? Uh, of course, it's going to have an impact on costs. We've settled with really 95% uh, um, at this point, um, unless we get a specific request as being that uh, upper limit. Mm. Um, Tony, what about uh, your technology? How how much CO2 can you capture? About 95 is probably an upper limit for us. What's interesting for us is that as as you go, we get really even north, so setting about 80% capture, as you go north of that, um, you know, we're targeting 90% capture, uh, but as you go higher in percentage capture, the fuel cell performance starts to go down because CO2 is one of the reactants. So you're giving it less and less reactants on, on the trailing edge. And so that power generation offset starts to go down. So mm -hmm. it's an economic question, really. Uh, somewhere north of 95%, there might be a fuel cell light question, but a 95% is probably the practical economic one. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Will? Yeah, I, I would actually argue there's potential to, to go the other way. Um, I, I know people have all the 90% the rule right came out from DOE and understanding is that that rule has actually been relaxed and um, that 90% is now not required from at least from DOE funded activity. Um, so I would say with our technology, we are the new technology, we want to get that to a 90%. But I would say that really around the economics, um, you know, if you go above 95% economically, uh, is that incremental capital uh, really worth it, the capital in OPEX? And the ability to, to evaluate even partial capture cases of 70 to 90% has not been traditional, uh, at least in the US and in, in other regions, they've looked at that. So um, mm -hmm. I think we do understand, I think you need a technology that can capture 90%. But really, it should be evaluated on, on the business case and what is the most economic. And that, that could actually be slightly below 90%. OK, excellent answers. Thank you uh, to all of you. Um, I'd probably add a comment to all of that as well, is that there's been a lot of talk in uh, recent times about net zero and about trying to get emissions down to zero, which I suspect might be behind some of these questions of, of wanting higher and higher capture fractions. So. Um, I guess that ultimately would be expressed in some way through policy and through incentives. Um, so you might find in future that there, there may be a driver to push those numbers a little higher. Um, we're, we're coming close to the end of our time. I think we've really only got time for, for one more question. And I guess it's a bit of a meta question for, for all of you, which is um, really where do, where do you see the, the, the most promising prospects for your technology over the next few years? I mean, where, where are the, where's the real sort of, um, the real promising uh, markets and angles for, for what you're selling? Well, uh, as I mentioned, we're, uh, we can apply the KMCDR process across a variety of different markets. What, what we're looking at, uh, I would say mostly currently, is in uh, power generation and really the use for CO2, um, whether it's enhanced fuel recovery, is kind of driving a lot of that. And so it's, it's also driving where these projects might be located. Um, there is some increased interest, I'll say, in industrial applications. Uh, I, I wouldn't really specifically focus on one particular industry. 
Um, of course, uh, if you're looking at CO2 intensity, the power sector, uh, right, is, is um, one of the largest CO2 producers. I think that that's going to continue um, to be the case, right? We've seen reports that uh, show that uh, natural gas, um, fossil fuels will, also, will be needed uh, for power generation for quite some time. Um, and, and as I mentioned, there's, there's uh, not just from our perspective, being interested in different industrial applications, but we're being approached as well uh, from different industries to see how the KMCDR process might apply. So I think it's really a broad range. Thanks, Jared. Uh, Tony? Yeah, our ultimate market focus is on large scale power generation, uh, coal generation in uh, natural gas combined cycle. Um, as I sort of showed in that uh, uh, picture of that plant there. But I do think that because we're an inherently modular technology and we're a new technology, people are gonna wanna see us operate at lower scales. And so to that end, I think the industrial uh, applications are gonna be very important early on as we commercialize this because uh, the, you can do it at smaller scales. It's easier to get projects done. People can kick the tires. And I think that'll be kind of the early market for us as the industry. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Will? Yeah, um, as, I, as I touched on in the presentation, um, we have a focus on the industrial market and also I would say the biofuels, biogas. I think those are two markets that we feel like the technology and the scale of the technology will have a really good fit. Um, I think we've all seen a lot of development in the cement industry in particular. There's a lot of focus on capture from kilns. And I think also thinking about the utilities footprint available at these industrial sites because we all you know with um, at least the solvent based technologies having a source of heat and cooling is really important and the utilities footprint can either make or kill a business case so identifying uh, industries like cement uh, refining to some extent i would say metals but uh, a little bit more difficult separation there but where there's some ability to access a heat source that's existing and then having uh, ability to tie into the, the cooling uh, system that that's available. Um, but then on the biofuel side, right, if you look at, at not just biogas, but biofuels, I mean, these products are really built around decarbonization. And so I think there's a next wave of where people look at, at these biologically dry processes and how do you integrate carbon capture with those and get the benefits out of um, whether it's it's you know the California incentives or other European incentives uh, on on the end fuel uh, and and integrating carbon capture with with those systems seems to be a logical fit also as a next wave. Excellent, thank you so much, Will. And um, that concludes our time for questions and answers. So uh, thank you to Jared, Tony, and Will. Um, just wanted to give a, a quick plug for our next event uh, on the 18th of June. Our next CCS talk is on Europe's next CCS facilities. Uh, there's a registration link there on, on the screen. And you can also view recordings of our past events uh, on the Institute's audio and visual library. There's a link there on the screen as well. Um, and uh, feel free to follow us on, um, on social media. So uh, it's been a pleasure to, to have our, our speakers on today. I, I thank you very much to Jared, Tony and Will. It's been uh, wonderful to hear your perspectives on, on technology and costs. Um, I think the future is looking bright for CCS. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much to everyone who's uh, tuned in to uh, listen to our webinar today. So thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.